Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Big Stompy Podcast. I'm your host, James Salyers, here with uh, Ross. Wait, no, Ross. Ross? Ross? Hey, Ross. No, no Ross tonight, fellas. Sorry. Busy. You know how things are. But I do have Master Guns, Todd Farnholtz, and Hugh the Modifier Peoples. Introduce you. Say hi, guys. Good afternoon. Hi, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's good evening for you guys. <laughs> it's good night over here. Especially for, for Hugh, right? Hugh, back back in the Eastern time zone, right? No, no, Starter? no, no. I'm still in Central. Oh, really? You're in Central. You must be pretty close to Eastern, though. Hey, you got to go to Knoxville to be in Eastern time. Okay, Knoxville. Is that like, is that a unit of measure? Is that like a mile, three miles? Never mind. About three hours east of me. Really? Wow. That's that's farther away than I thought it would be. But that's all, all <laughs> that's not cab related. We're here for cab. Yes, to, yes. Oh, Ilmarin, Ilmarin. Glad to, that's okay. Uh, you know, I'm glad you got your shot. Um, do what you got to do, buddy. Come back and see us next week if you don't feel up to it. But uh, so we're here tonight to talk uh, about a couple of things. Probably we're going to start out. We've got the combatants from this year's uh, virtual CavCon uh, uh, Cab Battle. Um, we had Todd playing Malvernus and Hugh playing like a sort of a miscellaneous. What was it, Hugh? No, I was playing Adon. But you weren't playing a like a named force, right? Todd was no, playing no, the no night. Name- the, the 19th Righteous Fire or 91st. I can't remember the number exactly. Uh, but, 19th uh, Righteous Fire was mine. That was uh, Malvernus. Right, 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 right. Okay, so 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 these two forces that uh, duked it out on the table was uh, was was really an interesting battle to see up close and watch watch how other people think about Cav. And um, we were looking for a topic for tonight. You know, I, it's one of my favorite things to do to to listen to people that really know what they're doing about games in general. So like Warhammer 40k all those other games that have big tournament scenes, Marvel Crisis Protocol. Uh, I like listening to how those people break the game down and tell me why they pick their units and how they find little bits of advantages and things like that to to leverage against their opponent. And um, that's not something we have very much of here in in CAB because we're still kind of, you know, kind of small compared to those other places, and at least in terms of the tournament scene. And... Um, here we've got an opportunity. We got two really good players who recently played a game. It's relatively fresh in their minds, and 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 it was a it was a high level game. So I thought we'd bring these guys on and give them a chance to share what they were thinking, share what they thought the critical points in the game were, just to just to let us in, bask in the in 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 the glow of their of their cab knowledge. To be quite frank with you, and I say that you know I'm 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 being a little flowery there, but I mean when you cut right to it. Todd, you're you're like a multiple time CavCon winner, and Hugh, I, I don't know that you ever won a tournament, but I've seen you play, and it's you're serious. So so I am excited. I'm very excited to hear what you two have to say about this battle. No, well, I've not excited. won any tournaments, but yeah. I I had the fact the only one I played was 2019. Okay. Well, I played you in 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 one of those tournaments, and and um I I, yeah, right I mean. There. Yes, that's me. Um, that being said, you were a great opponent. I enjoyed playing you. Your force was a menace. If uh, um, things could have easily turned out differently. Yes, Hugh. Hugh certainly in 2019 uh, gave me a run for my money um, during the. I don't remember if it was during. No, I didn't play during the War Master. It was just yeah. during the regular. Tournament. No, it's yeah. Capcom. Yeah. So Our, definitely. Uh, so we have two experienced players here, and 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 now I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna poke them with a stick and get them to come out of their corners and tell us a little bit about about um, about the game that they had uh, just a week or three ago. Um, Todd, you, let's start with you. Just just kind of give us a, a general overview of the force that you brought, what your what what your thoughts were when you came to the table, and 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 especially when you looked at Hugh's force, what was it about it that caught your eye? All right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was what I was really most excited to talk about was uh, kind of getting the insight of, uh, of Q uh, during that game. But uh, so my force was the Malvernus 19th Righteous Fire, uh, which um, luckily enough was a regiment that uh, John so graciously allowed me to create for for uh, 
the CAD universe. Um, so I created the scheme and then kind of the, the general thought process behind them was for them to all be uh, very high mobility uh, city fighters. So a lot of um, uh, what's the essay that gives you the uh, ability to move through rough terrain without a superior mobility, superior mobility. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so a lot of them had that. Most of them had that. Um, and I also wanted to be durable, and so uh, most of them had uh, uh, reinforced, uh, either one or two, or rugged, or um, uh, I think it's rugged, the one that allows you to ignore movement, mm -hmm. movement criticals, if I remember correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, yeah, so that, that was the thought process behind them, was, was to be very quick and able to um, uh, kind of dictate the flow of the battle by uh, mobility and electronics warfare. So that's why uh, one, my recon section was four razors in a shadow, whereas the attack section was um, two white A's, two assassins, and um, oh, I had one other, oh, and another shadow, I'm sorry, for the recon attachment. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I had a standalone uh, specialist section that was more or less just a filler because I needed to get to 4,500 points of a reaver uh, just because I really like the reaver and so I even modded up a, a model for it because it doesn't currently exist. So, um, I don't know, Hugh, did you want to, uh, Hugh or James, did you want to interject anything there? Um, so, go yeah, ahead, I Hugh. Mean, go ahead. No, Hugh, you. Yeah, you're doing pretty good as it is. Uh, okay. Okay. Just yeah. So, uh, but again, sorry. Let me jump in here because the one thing that I want to point out, um, the thing that I had never occurred to me to do was was that single model specialist squad. Now, you said in your description the reason you put it in there was was because you needed to fill out your points, and I get that 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 completely makes sense. But you probably could have rearranged some other squads to eat those points up if you really wanted to. That that single model squad gave you an extra activation card. So instead of running with two, you got a chance to run with three. And so, of course, that that improves your odds of, of, of drawing an activation. And I think that was really important and, and an important aspect of the fight that we're going to talk about in in the next few minutes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because, um, well, it, those who may not be aware, Malvernus has the... Uh, um, uh, I guess you want to car call it part of their doctrine is they're running squads of five. And so, um, you know, if, if you want that extra activation card with them, you have to basically take a, a, a short specialist squad as it were. So it was kind of twofold. I wanted that third card. Um, but I also wanted to be able to use that model, um, only because I just, again, uh, it, one of those situations where there's nothing more tactically behind it than I just wanted to use the model. And the points just happened to work out to where I was 100 and, or 4,489 or something like that. So it worked out perfectly. Cool. So, so when you looked across the table at Hughes Force, which, which we'll just run through it real quick. Um, I got the printout here. So Hugh had, in no particular order, um, a, the Chancellor, Cyclop, Cyclops, Wyvern, Bishop II, Javin, Javin, uh, Javelinier, Hylum, Royal Chieftain, and the Highlander, which, which that's a tank squad right there. There's an indirect fire squad there and an attack squad, I think. Is that accurate, Hugh? Two attack squads. Two attack squads. Okay, okay. So... So Todd, when when you saw that stuff across the table, what, what what caught your eye? Well, my my first thought was again, also being an Adon player, is uh, the Royal Chieftains combined with the Highlander. I knew that was going to be sniper squad, uh, and given the fact that I had a recon squad of of relatively low armor uh, guys, um, I definitely wanted to use terrain to my advantage to try and minimize their ability to, uh, you know, knock my razors out before they could get in the middle of things and do what they needed to do. Uh, but truthfully, my biggest um, point of contention, you'll call it, <laughs> with Hugh's squad was uh, with the fire support section because my fire support was uh, minimal, if, if at all existent. I think I had a couple of rocket pins. 
Um, and I knew that if he got a couple lucky shots with his strike point rolls, that that was going to ruin um, some of my electronic warfare day. So um, in the first turn, when he decided to go after my Reaver uh, to try and take away one of my cards is what I was assuming. Um, I was kind of like breathing an inner sigh of relief because I, I would much rather lo lose a Reaver and a card than lose the um, a member of my recon squad. That's really interesting. All right, so let's take a break there and let's 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 move over and let Hugh uh, catch up to where you are. Hugh, tell us about your force a little bit, what you were thinking, and then and then tell us what you saw from Todd that really made you sit up and pay attention. So, so yeah, I took uh, two attack squads and a fire support squad. Um, uh, I'm used to playing Ritterlick, so I like having a fire support squad. I like being able to touch the other side of the board without having to be on the other side of the board. And um, so one of the models I wanted to use was a Cyclops. And since we've not been graced with that model yet, I decided to make my own. And that was kind of the leader of my uh, group there. But for the rest of my since I knew my fire support group wasn't going to be too fast, um, I decided to reinforce it with two attack squads that did have some mobility with them that could react to things uh, pretty quickly on either side of the board when it come down to it. So that's why the Chancellor and um, the two Waverns, I uh, took the two Waverns because they had double time, they had um, some light max on them, and it gave me the chance to, you know, be able to touch things without needing to be up close and personal with them, like a PVG require you to be. So, started the game, it kind of went the way I wanted. Uh, Todd put his recon section in the back, one back corner, his attack squad in kind of the mid corner, other corner, and then uh, he put his revenant in the center. And of course, I'm like, if I remove the revenant, that removes one card from him. And I know a couple of lucky hits from the fire support group and the Royal Chieftain should remove that pretty quickly. Uh, the fire support did pretty well. The Royal Chieftains, on the other hand, couldn't roll to hit the broadside of a barn. Hmm. Even even when I got on top of one of his razors, they still didn't want to hit anything. Uh, so, so when uh, his recon squad got Two things that kind of did me in is one, his ability to move a activation card to the bottom of the deck with that uh, recon squad and uh, the recon squad getting pretty much making my royal chieftains useless and getting within minimum range of my fire support squad before I turned to deal with them is uh, kind of what did me in because when his uh, attack squad took out one of my wave rooms, uh, it had no problem taking out the rest of the left side of the, or my right side of the board. And he pretty much had the game right there. Okay. So, so Hugh, if you were to, to, if you were to pick one of your squads that you think underperformed, which one would you say it would be? It would have been that uh, pink squad I took, the second attack squad. Okay. So, so you expected to get a lot of work out of those guys, and they just didn't deliver for you. Well, the thought was one attack squad would handle things on one side of the board, 
the fire support would help weaken any target I wanted to bring down. And then the Royal Chieftains having medium max would just finish out the target. They, you know, like Todd said, they were uh, the sniper squad to uh, finish off anything that the fire support didn't. And they really underperformed. I probably either having my own uh, recon squad or maybe uh, going more electronic warfare than I did probably would have done me a uh, better use. So let's talk a little bit more about the performance of that of that tank squad. So it sounds like you had high expectations for them. And and for throughout the course of the game, they just didn't really do what you wanted them to do. Was it was it a matter of positioning? Do you think you chose the wrong for them? How could you have, if you had the magic wand to go back in time and 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 change how you use that squad? What do you think you could do to improve their performance? Um, loaded die. All right, all right, all right. I mean, you could always just pay Todd a hundred dollars to throw the game. There's, there's, there's always that route, I guess. There, there's that too, but um, um, but well, uh, it, if I could interject real quick, um, go ahead. Some, something I do want to point out is, um, you know, you were talking about how the the dice weren't necessarily in your favor. Um, well. You also have to remember, too, I was running heavy APA and ECM, so I was getting, you know, huge bonuses to my roles uh, because, you know, all my, my, my recon squad with the APA was, um, well, I mean, both both of my sections had a, an APA carrying unit on it, so I was getting plus twos as long as that APA was active, uh, and then with all the ECM my razors had, it was preventing you from knocking that out, so... Um, Dice rolls definitely played a part in it, but at the same time, um, my target numbers were a lot lower than yours. Yeah. Uh, had I taken probably a recon squad of dragonflies and, I don't know, maybe another, and who knows, maybe even my... Uh, uh, a different type of fire uh, sniper support for Adon, maybe it would have worked out better in my favor. I mean, dragonflies being able to zoom all over the board and um, provide an APA 2 to my entire army, it probably would have really helped that um, squad out in Darren is where the Highlander didn't perform as well as I thought it would because it was only an ECM2 only. Um, where I think what it helped it is if the Highlander could have also provided APA2. And so that would have helped that squad out tremendously because it's not that my dice rolls were that bad. It was they were just not good enough to push to to get the hit in to give you that margin that you needed yeah okay so 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 let's kind of create a bullet point here i think it's 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 a reasonably safe statement to say that when you're designing a, a competitive cav force that you really have to have a, a plan for the electronic warfare sub game whether that's ecm and target or uh blocking target locks or if it's APA and, and gaining pluses to hit for your squad, you have to you have to be ready to answer the other players' questions, which which Todd brought in spades, and you have to be ready to ask your own questions. You know, hey, I've got these assets. How are you, my opponent, going to deal with them? I think that's a truism uh, when it comes to competitive cav lists. Now, that being said, we got a question from the chat. I want to, Ilmarin is asking, um, and I'll ask both of you to talk about this. Um, he says, or he asks, do you think standard chieftains would have been a better, um, would have played a better role than those royal chieftains that you put in there? Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know the stats for a standard chieftain off the top of my head. Hopefully, one of you two might might know that. Hold on, I think yeah. they have PBE instead of 
Um, they do. They're uh, arm, armor six, speed ten, so they get double time. Uh, I'm sorry, armor might be wrong. They might be armor five. Armor five. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, but they do have a. Yeah, uh, they do have yeah, the medium PBGs. Uh, I, I love love chieftains. That's probably my favorite tank in the whole game. Dilmarin, if you have a chance, can you post the the regular chieftains points up in the chat? I see you 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 know the. 169. Regular chieftains on 169. So they're a little yeah, bit cheaper Royal. than the Royal Chieftains. Okay. The Royal. 186. 186. Yeah. All right. So so, so talk about much. that. Do you what do you think if if you if you'd replace those Royal Chieftains with PPG Chieftains, do you think that would have been um, something you could have you could have done differently? Would that have helped? Hmm. I don't think so because even at point blank range, I still had a hard time getting the Royal Chieftains to hit anything. I mean, you got three that are point blank and you roll three dice and only one hits. And then when it hits, it whiffs and gets one point of damage at point blank. Yeah. I mean, even a PBG um, wouldn't have helped well, me much right there. You, you also have to consider, uh, Hugh, that uh, the regular chieftains would play differently than the royal chieftains would because they would have been a, an excellent uh, screening force for my razors because they're they're fast and they hit hard. I mean, I've I've played games where a, a regular chieftain has taken out a razor in two turns. You know. Let's see. Does the regular chieftain have? What I think it does. Yeah, you you overdrive that medium PBG, and it's you know, man, it's almost game over for anything armor five or less. See, I know it does. It doesn't have a. It doesn't, doesn't have, have assault one. So. Okay. The assault one would get, yeah, I could run it. Um, I could run and gun. Uh, 16 and be able to shoot with no penalty with that, so I could get, definitely get up in his face real quick. But since they don't have assault one, then no, wouldn't couldn't run and gun unless I'd have negative one. And it's not like I needed more negative modifiers for my to hit rolls than what I had. So, so Todd, what what about his positioning with those with those tanks? Is there a is there a way that you could see him like? Placing that squad somewhere else or maneuvering in, in a different way, as I recall, it stayed kind of uh, off to Hughes' left, um, uh, your right. It, they, they they sort of worked that very far edge of the board, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the way he, he played them was was actually exactly how I would have. Uh, given that they're hover tanks, they have pop up. I would have kept them right up on that hill. Uh, and just almost acted as like an area denial, uh, you know, just snipers, you know, with the, the they would, what I see, we played on what, a six foot board. So with those medium max, um, yeah, they, they'd still, you know, be able to shoot what three, almost three quarters of the way. Um, so again, that, that, that's where, that's what I thought he was going to do. And that's why I really tried to, uh, to use my, the speed of my razors to, uh, uh, Utilize terrain for cover because I thought he was just going to sit up there and snipe the whole game, which is because that's what I would have done. <laughs> so I guess the question that I might ask, and this is completely in retros, in, in 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 hindsight and retrospect, um, instead of pushing them off to the left there, what if he had just sort of kept his forces together in that corner and, you know, I, I mean he brought a, a giant, he put a ton of points into that fire support squad. Um, you could have used the the chieftain squad and and the other uh, attack squad to sort of create a buffer zone to keep people away from the fire support squad and keep them together so they have like uh, they're better able to support with with their fire. Is is that a possibility? I mean, you didn't have a ton, Todd. I say Todd. You didn't have a ton of rockets, so bunching up for him isn't nearly as dangerous as it was for you. Correct, and then honestly, that that's kind of what I expected him to do was just uh, um, basically create a you know a, a pillbox, if you will, um, that it was just gonna snipe at my guys as they as they tried to get in. Um, but you know, 
it played out how it played out, I guess. All right. So, so we've talked a little bit about that squad. So, so what do you think the the turning point in the game was? At what point in time did it did it go from being you know like a contest to hey, I think I've got the advantage here? Uh, are you asking me or Hugh? Well, I mean, you're the one that ended up with the advantage. So let's start with you. Okay. Um, for me, I'd say the turning point was when. Uh, my attack section, this is going to sound weird, but it's when my attack section got up and dropped his Chancellor, Wyvern, and I think Javelinier. That might have been the Javelinier over there. Um, in like one or two turns towards the end, uh, which totally opened up his flank for my, my Whites and my Assassin um, to kind of sweep around back behind his fire support squad. You, what do you think? When did it start to slip through your fingers? That you? Same point. So you agree that was the turning point? You? Yeah, I mean when we when that when his attack section started downing my right side of the board and uh and his uh Recon section was within minimum range of my fire support. I mean, it was pretty much over for me. Okay, so so do you do you feel like that that big fire support section that 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 you put together? Do you think they underperformed for you? No, they actually did pretty well. Um, okay, it was it was my chancellor didn't. Well, he did do good the one time that he. Yeah, I seem to remember him causing quite a bit of damage to one or both of yeah. my white whites, if I remember correctly. But uh, I, I think due to the last time I played Todd, I he took a he took a uh, hit. Uh, a unit with a big fire support group and I spread out like he had fire support not not really knowing what it was he had on the other side of the table. Oh uh, yeah with the, the mana cores, yeah. Yeah he uh his uh so me not realizing that he had next to nothing for fire support, yeah that's what I should have done was made it real hard for him to get to my fire support and make him have to go through the two attack squads and I didn't really didn't really do that. So um so so in yeah. general it, go ahead. No 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 I was just gonna say so yeah so that was that was pretty much my downfall. That and uh not being able to counteract uh, his electronic warfare either not as effectively as he could put it out all right so so let's talk a little bit about this 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 pretty beefy uh, fire support squad that that you feel that and and really just just fire support squads in general so so when you when you decide that that a, a significant amount of your punching power is going to come out of a fire support squad in my head what i'm thinking is i'm looking to 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 get what I call free hits. All right. So when I when I drop an area of effect template on on top of a model, every other model I happen to get lucky and hit with that thing, that's effectively multiplying the the power, the effectiveness, whatever word you want to use of that fire support squad. Because essentially what I've gotten to do is I've gotten to attack two, three, four, however many models are underneath the template uh, with one activation. And and to me, that is really the strength of of, of the fire support squads, the, the, the templated weapons. And so uh, as a fire support player, I'm trying to, I'm trying to leverage that as much as I can. And I imagine as, as a person trying to avoid that, uh, I, I'm, I'm spreading out and avoiding choke points on the map. If I possibly can, I, I'm trying to limit the, the fire support players ability to, to get those free hits. Um, what do you guys think? Is, is that accurate? Oh, absolutely, and that—that's—that's that's exactly why I made sure I kept. Uh, see, 
I think early in the game, I had asked Hugh, what's the AOE on those, uh, on your, on your, uh, Cyclops. And, uh, I think it had what rocket 15. So it's AOE four, if I remember correctly. Two with, with radius of four, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it might, it might've been eight or three, but, uh, in any case, I made damn sure that I had all my models spaced out to where he couldn't hit two of them if I could all help it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was <clears throat> AOE two. Yeah, so it's one under the the TMX. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I, I guess I probably must have made it a point to uh, to keep them spread out. What at five then? You know, even yeah, even you, to. Did keep everything pretty. You kept everything more than three or four inches from each other. Yeah. So no, I, yeah, didn't, I didn't get any extra hits. I wanted to. So as the fire support player, how what can you do to to kind of force your opponent into those bunches? How do you make them um, give you that that those free hits? What sort of strategies are there in your mind to, 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 to cause that to happen? You use the terrain since that's not anything, well, <clears throat> aside from buildings. Buildings can be destroyed just walking through them, but you use the immovable terrain that they can't uh, move through, and you try to make them go through that, which that was kind of my plan was to make him bunch up and come at me from one side, but he didn't really fall for it. He did spread his force out pretty thin and it just ended up being, um, he had the, the right counter to what I was trying to get him to do on either side. I pushed heavier on my left side, and he pushed heavier on his right side, and my right side couldn't really keep his right side held up as much as I wanted it to. So, see, the one thing that I saw when I looked at that battle and the way the way that Todd deployed, so there was that giant pyramid in the middle, right, which is uh, basically blocked, created a giant shadow for line of sight, as, as I recall. And Todd, I think, I think correct me if i'm wrong but you sent your razor recon squad from your perspective down the right hand side of the board and your your attack squad um kind of to the left and that reaver that solo specialist squad was eh, middle-ish kind of is that accurate yeah. uh-huh yeah so, i um yeah go ahead sorry i i was just gonna say so 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 when i s saw that when i was re-watching the video this week you know it occurred to me that as 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 the fire support players, Hugh, when I saw that he he had he was going to split his force up and, and come down both sides of that pyramid, to me, the right thing to do is to pick one of those two sides and try and get as many of my units onto that side in terms of firepower as possible. Because the round or, or possibly two is going to take, a, let's say, the recon squad to come out of the shadow of that pyramid and get to the point where they can be effective again is a round of two, a round or two in which you can concentrate fire on that attack squad and maybe get get a temporary numeric advantage, superior firepower, while while the recon squad is trying to come around that 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 pyramid. Now it's not so big that they couldn't shoot you, but I mean, there's going to be some time when they're behind it, and then sometimes when they're at kind of longish range as they start to come out of it. And I think that was an opportunity for you to pounce on the other squad. At least that's my thought. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, that, that hadn't occurred to me at the time, but now that you say it, um, I think even when we did the after action, John had mentioned um, – Looking at my force, what you would have done was uh, set up choke points, and I think that's exactly what uh, uh, what you're referring to there. And it's yeah. exactly what I didn't do. So, in retrospect, uh, Hugh, how might you how might you deploy differently? Um, <clears throat> considering I did get kind of the initiative to be able to. Boy, after him, uh, 
probably what I should have done is uh, deployed. I mean, I don't think I would have changed my deployment much, but maybe my movement. I started sending a, I split up my second fire support and was pushing them um, to my right and trying to push everything else towards his recon squad. And probably what I should have done was um, let, let him take his time with his recon squad coming at me and just concentrate all my attack squad fire on his attack squad and let the fire support take out his electronic uh, guys in his recon as I could because my strike point rules were dead on every time. It, um, yeah, they were. I don't think we had to calculate for any of the strike point rolls because I kept rolling tens or better. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that, in hindsight, I think that's probably what I've done, but it's, God, it's been uh, over a year, year and a half since we've played any game so it was just let's play and have fun and whatever happens happens yeah it was definitely definitely one of those games where we were knocking the cobwebs off agreed about the cobwebs i i still haven't played and uh i probably didn't play as much as you guys did certainly not as much as todd did even back when things were available i was always like teaching uh new people how to play all right so so you know we've kind of covered you know the big points you know I, again, I I, I kind of like to just just emphasize because it really stands out to me like like the pyramid in the middle of the table. That solo, uh, what was it, a reaver? Yeah, a reaver that you had in that specialist squad. It seems to me like like that was that was use opportunity to sort of counterbalance that re, the Todd's recon ability. So so Todd had a recon squad. He could once per turn. Uh, say that the card that got turned up got put on the bottom of the deck and we flipped up a new card. Um, if 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 Hugh had managed to take out that reaver, Todd would have had to remove one of his cards from the deck, right? Which would have meant that the recon ability is actually in kind of in, in Hugh's favor now. I mean, even if you flip one of Hugh's cards, let's say at the very beginning of the turn, if, if we'd gotten rid of the reaver, there would have been three cards for Hugh and two cards for Todd, and if one of the Hughes cards pops up and, and you recon it to the bottom, it's still 50-50 who's going to draw, right? So to me, that would have really kind of taken the wind out of the sail of that recon advantage that you had. And Hugh, you went after that squad, I think, with your very first shot, as I recall, didn't you? No, I went after the Reaver. My objective was to get rid of that um, or the Revenant. To get no, it's rid a Reaver. Of the... It's a reaver. A reaver was it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that was my entire objective, and the fire support squad did what they were supposed to. They wailed on him and brought him down. The sniper squad that was supposed to finish taking him out, could, like I say, couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And so, as I recall, that model was on the table most of the game. Did, did it ever no, get it destroyed? The, I never, no. The... I finally refocused back on him and the fire support um, wailed on him one more time and it would have been just, I think, one, two, three more damage tracks and he would have been gone. Yeah, it was it was hurting there towards the end for sure. And so Ilmarin from the uh, from the chat says that he feels that uh, – a re the recon ability is worth more than a card alone. A card is a chance that you get to act. A recon denial is certain. Um, I guess the one thing I'll, I'll I'll make a comment about that before I turn it over to you guys to to get your thoughts is Ilmarin. I, I mean, you 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 can certainly send a card to the bottom, and that's that's for sure. But you you still are randomly getting a card from the top of the deck, so there's there's still a lot of chance in there. Um, but I agree with you. Uh, recon uh, recon is probably it it's certainly a worthwhile ability i just my point was that um since since hugh didn't have a recon squad his his ability to kind of weaken 
Todd's advantage was to get rid of that extra card. That would help balance uh, some of the shenanigans that Todd was able to play. At least that's what I think would happen. What do you guys think about, about Ilmarin's question? Is the recon ability worth more than an extra card? Uh, for for me, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and and only I only say that because uh, Ross at one of our games had uh, proven that in space. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the reasons I like playing Ritterlick is you take an all Ritterlick force, you don't have to take a recon to get that recon ability. They have a uh, a doctrine that gives you that ability and to, to then have that ability and take a recon squad it's I've done it before I've denied where Todd used the deny against me a couple of times and it bit him in the butt because the next card was me again I've done it to people that have you know denied Okay, so then my card comes up, they deny me, and then next card comes up, it's them again. I've got that second deny, I go deny again, and it's back to me and not them, and, you know, they hate me for it when I play that way. Um, but, of course, that's not any – that's just friendly games that <laughs> I get people to hate me in, and because uh, it's the only time we really use the, the doctrines. <laughs> I just have to pause for a second and 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 highlight the, the statement I think I heard you say. So it's it's only it's it's a friendly game that you're making people hate you in. Did, did you say that? Okay. That <laughs> is. All right. Achievement unlocked, I think. All right. <laughs> well, I mean, I deny, you deny, I deny you again, and mm -hmm. you're like, yes, I got this, but did I? You know, I pulled the second denial out, and you're like, but, but, but. Mm. It it just it frustrates people when they can't go when they think they should. I mean, it's not like people don't know you have that ability, right? I mean, it's not like a hidden piece of information. So, you know, they should be no, aware of that, I suppose. But, but, you know, when when the chance comes about, hey, it's all fair and love and war. That being said, the faction doctrines are not normally part of tournament games, and we're not even sure in 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 the. John has said a few times, I think that he's going to restructure the 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 faction doctrines and and how they're used and how the, and which ones are included and in what they are. So we don't know which ones are going to survive. So I mean, and, and, until he begins to talk about those or releases uh, his new vision for the doctrines, we're not even sure who's going to have what doctrines. So I mean, yeah. the the core doctrines aren't going to change much for the core units, but like the Amethrill, where they had the Leaf Lynn, uh with Ritterlick to give them more units, that was part of their doctrine. So you could take Ritterlick units and use them like they were Amethrill, but now we have the Ritterlick Class B uh, mm -hmm. has for Emerthrill, and it's opened up what you can and can't do with the Emerthrill list now. So that doctrine really isn't needed anymore. And the other one, which is where you got a free, uh, not a free, but you could get a veteran uh, Templar squad uh, with all the units that you have now. Yeah, it, that's not really going to be needed as well. So because I think at that point in time, the re it was like the whole reason Amethril had such uh, a smaller list of Amethril units was to play that, you know, Amethril is kind of the new kid on the block, and they don't have all the resources that the other uh, factions have. Interesting. They, they are certainly probably the youngest. In no, that's not true. The Almirathil are not effectively Aiden E's. Actually, the Civil War happened before the Terrans ever even knew what space flight was. So, right. mm, interesting. So they're definitely not the youngest, not by a long stretch. Maybe their resources no, are just, just more limited. 
yes, their resources are more limited. I mean, you, if you look at the the map of the known area that we're that is on the website, you know, they've got maybe 12, 14 planets. Aiden E's have got 40, 50. Yeah, no doubt. System. They're certainly richer. Until Almirathil finally overthrows Adon, and then they have all the planets, right? <laughs> all right, all right. So I think we've covered the the scenario in in an adequate amount of depth. I mean, if you, if you get a chance, and you want to you want to go back and take a look at it, you can see some of the things that we're talking about. I I think there's some really interesting lessons to be learned here. I I personally have never played with that recon card flipping trick, and it looks really really interesting and powerful. Um, I think we definitely saw the strength of uh, APA and ECM. Um, Hugh, that 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 fire support squad you built, kind of. I mean, I think it's got tremendous output potential. It just it, so for some I reason or another, it was. Chance. Yeah, maybe maybe if you played that game again, I think there might there might be a a different outcome. It's probably the best way to say that. It probably would be. Um, and. At the same time, I also have to show people that while people think that the right is a skimpy unit, um, it actually it get the two rights I had gave Todd a run for his money. He actually he didn't put them down in one. Oh, you two mean the wyverns? Huh? You mean you mean the wyverns? The wi yeah the wyverns. Yeah, you keep saying yeah. whites. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, the what the wyvern the river, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, no, I was uh, I was very impressed by how well they performed. Actually, um, if if I'm being 100 percent honest, I mean, I kept them, I kept their movement up as much as I could, so it made it harder for you to hit them, and uh, that's part of something you 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 can't judge a unit by its that you've got to look at the whole package and you've got to use everything in that package to its whole ability i mean uh you making them move 10 inches or more every turn essentially makes them too harder to hit yeah i mean that's literally what double time is right mm -hmm. all right so so I think we've 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 hammered out this battle enough. We got a few minutes left, uh, ten or twelve minutes here at the end of the show, and I want to take a left hand turn. All right, guys. So so I kind of got this before the beginning of the show. So now we're gonna we're gonna turn away from the hardcore dice mechanics like maneuvering templates, rolling for ranges, overheating, all that stuff. We're gonna move away from that, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Cav RPG. All right. So we don't know much about it yet, so we're not gonna get into the minutia and details. We don't. It's not, it's not even vaguely ready, but we could talk about it in the grand scheme of things, right? So so just off the cuff, right? You guys, I know you're veteran gamers. You must have done some role playing. If 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 we were designing um, a squad, like like a team to to do a cab RPG scenario at a, at a convention or something, what role are you going to take? All right, I'm going to start out with Todd, all right? So the traditional roles, fighter, healer, rogue wizard right that's the fantasy role so so in modern days we show you have soldier we have medic or, or doctor however you want to phrase that we've got the assassin or the or, or or the espionage expert and then we've got like the technologist all right so just you you're you get to pick first todd what role are you taking in in our in our hypothetical cav rpg group you know, in in my D and D days, uh, I always played the you know the fighter or the barbarian, uh, just because that's that's just the the mentality I would, I I had when playing games. You know, hit it until it stops moving. I'd probably play a rock fighter, um, mainly because and John's probably going to cringe a little bit at this. Uh, I did read the the Big Dance, the uh, the Cav uh, uh, the original Cav novel. Uh, I do have a copy of it, and um, I really liked the rock character that was part of the Red Spades. Um, he was not what I, at all, uh, personality-wise, what I imagined the rock to be, and uh, I really enjoyed the character. So that would that'd be probably what I would pick, and then I'd fashion him off of that. So, so you're playing a, a rock soldier of some kind, right? 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so, so the soldier is off the board, Hugh. What are you taking? You've got next pick. I'm taking the technology person. I want to be the hacker. Okay. So you're effectively our 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 sci-fi wizard, right? So so tell us a little bit about about this hypothetical character. What faction are they? Well, just just tell us tell us what you would love to play in your dream Cav character. What is it? It's probably going to be Aiden Mee's, uh technologist hacker, whatever you want to say. Um, just because you know they've been around the tech the longest, so they're going to have the most experience with it. Um, you know, I'm I'm here for the money. Uh, who's got the money is who's got me. So uh, <laughs> you pay well, I do well. Okay. Um. So so is this is this character of yours is the uh, is the uh, uh, is he is he a freelancer? Is he is is he is he is he working secretly for somebody else? Is he is he an aid and he's spy who goes out and does things, or is he just he's tired of living in aid on space? What's he like a little bit more? Why is he out doing uh, this stuff? If I told you too much, then I'd have to kill you. And that makes for a wonderful subject. I mean, it entertains everybody who's listening to us. So yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so. I mean, so, yeah, who the that's the thing with role playing games. There's so much you can imagine and do that it's always the limit of your imagination. So yeah, who's to say I'm not playing uh, a double agent spy that's a freelancer and he's freelancing at this moment in time because um, the aid needs need him together intel on a, this new Merc unit that's forming up that caused them some problems and he's going to be working around them. So, uh, so yeah, while he's there performing one job, he, you know, in secret, he's doing another job. More money for me, right? Hey, if you can, if you can burn the candle from both ends, you, you, uh, why not? Why not? I mean, that, that that never goes badly, right? <laughs> never. All right. I don't know. So 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 now my turn. All right. So <laughs> I'll be have it. I like it. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna choose the 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 face. I guess is what you want to call it. Sort of the 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 talker. Sort of the person who's gonna be like the spokes the spokesperson for the group. I'm gonna play a Templar. I'm gonna play. The, like the noble child of some high-ranking Templar family from, from back in the day. So I'm going to be like, you know, the equivalent of, of, of Prince Harry or, or Prince Philip in, in our world, right? So this, 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 this character who should not be allowed to be out running around where things are dangerous mm -hmm. because they're way too important for that sort of thing. But somehow I got out here, right? I escaped okay. my handlers. Managed to slip off into the into the ether, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm having a good time. So I've got charisma, I've got money, I've got reputation. I, I, I'm an important person, um, and so I'm, I'm really good at, at making contacts and getting our little group some, uh, you know, like like a mission. But, but I also come with baggage because people are like, eh, you know, we if we capture that person, we could sell them back for a bunch of money. So so it's always causing us trouble. So not only do my I have tons of contacts. I've also come with tons of problems. Uh, not, not, not the least of which are probably my handlers who are trying to hunt me down and bring me back to where I'm really supposed to be. So that's what I'm going to play. <laughs> yes, Ilmarin. Yes, the Royal Blues are, are, are looking for me. I'm, I'm a lost member of the Royal Blues, and uh, those people are freaking out because they can't find me. That's what's going on there. <laughs> All right. Um, so Ross isn't here. He doesn't get to defend himself, guys. Tell me a little bit about Ross's character. Just make it up. What, what kind of character do you think Ross would play? <laughs> Come on now. Oh, man. Um, Ross. I think Ross would be, he would be an assassin or whatever, whatever the, the yeah. rogue assassin equivalent would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I say I that just because 
I, I just that that yeah that that's definitely what Ross would be hands down no questions asked. I mean that that's how he is he's ruthless to the point got to get the kill no matter what. Yeah, exactly. You you put that very well, Hugh. So let me share a little story about you. And 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 we're picking on Ross because he 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 didn't make it to the show. I'm sure he had a fantastic reason. That's just what buddies do, right? You miss yeah. a meeting. People talk about you. So here you go, Ross, for everybody to hear. All right. So back before I ever really met Ross, right? I was I was brand new to Cav. I was I was I was have, having a good time. I was kind of I noticed there wasn't a lot of people posting about it, right? So I'm getting ready for my very first cab tournament. I got a buddy, he and I are play testing. So I'm taking pictures and I'm I'm posting notes and I'm just I'm trying to generate a little noise, right? I'm I'm sharing ideas with people. I have a completely crappy list. I said to myself, I'm gonna play Templars, I'm gonna play all Templar models. And so I'm out, I'm just I any metal Templar model I could find, I bought. And so that was my force. There was no designing no uh, i need a piece of apa and edcm none of that it was like what can i find because back then we didn't have the plastics that we have now and so i had this force and i'm posting my ideas and i'm doing all this other stuff and ross is taking notes and designing lists so that he can kick my beanie right <laughs> that that's what ross is doing so so ross my hat's off to you you are the person i would put in charge of leading us out of a dangerous situation but I think Todd's right. You're you're definitely playing somebody who's whose damage is um, uh, maximized. Let's just put it like that. Yes, <laughs> that's a that's a very apt way of putting it. I think. So so uh, you know, <laughs> I hope everybody's enjoying that. So uh, you know, in chat, if 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 you have an idea, I see uh, uh, the Hobby Habit made a comment: a rock soldier and an age and, and, and an Adenese agent hacker Merc. I, I mean, to me, I think that would be really interesting. Just the idea of a of getting to encounter a rock, like in the you know, like getting to know them, being around them for a while. I, I can't imagine what that's like. I, I I'm really looking forward to get for for John to get his ideas down about about what the rock are really. Um, I, he and I have had a, some some off 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 uh, off the Ethernet off off the internet. Uh, conversations about that, and, and and I always wonder how do they, how do they overcome this sort of uh, mentality they have? We're just like no camo. We're not messing around. We're not maneuvering. We're coming at you. We're just like we're we're just we're just a, a knife thrust. How how do they compete with modern militaries who are you know is smart and you know try and think around a problem and you know have intelligence and are willing to hide and backstab you and like lure you into a trap where the rocker just like I'm painting my cab pink and I'm I'm coming down this road I'm not hiding in the trees I'm just going to walk down here and shoot you how do they survive I, I'm I'm real curious to see what John has how he deals with that dilemma. You know something that I, I really and again uh, going back to the uh, that that book I was referencing the Big Dance. Uh, what I really liked about the Rock character is you know in the in the fiction you know they're they're a no nonsense warrior people, and yet this particular one was kind of an outcast because he was a he was a real smart ass actually, and he always you know um, uh, he would call the the. I think it was the Adenese member of the squad who would call it like long ears or something like that, you know, but it was totally a term of endearment. Um, so he was kind of like the, the, the gentle giant of the group. And I have a feeling, uh, well, it's it, uh, maybe, maybe not a feeling, maybe it's more of just a, a hope that not all the rock are just these, these brutes, you know, that, that most of them are actually probably pretty, um, I don't know center of of what we perceive them to be as as a, a, a homo homo sapien type race, you know, with the, with the anthropomorphic qualities like we would attribute to ourselves is what I'm trying to say. Um, and yeah, I just I I think they'd be the funnest character to develop, you know, because there's there's a preconceived notion, and then you can kind of just go out of left field with it. Hugh, you got anything you want to throw in there at the last minute? Mm. I mean, not really. It's, 
been a long, long time since I've really thought about playing any sort of RPGs or anything. Um, I mean, usually if I'm playing an RPG, I'm playing something, <clears throat> some MMO online to pass the time. Um, and I'm just doing it. Something like this, I mean, I don't know. I used to what I did for having fun with RPGs is just to explore the personality types that I kind of relate to, but is not really me, and just kind of have fun exploring them and uh, seeing how it would be from a different perspective. I think that's definitely one of the main purposes, at least in my experience, for for a good RPG game is to give the players the ability to to sort of explore spaces that they don't normally encounter, uh, problem solve, sort of handle moral dilemmas. You know, it's sort of like a philosophy class on the table, right? You know, you get to here's this thing: do we do we do we take a prisoner? Do we kill the prisoner? How do we handle him? He's going to try and escape. Do, do, how do we deal with that sort of thing? And I think there's a, that's one of their strengths. They give you the opportunity to, to, to tell stories that explore spaces that interest you. And I think that's, that's something I'm really looking forward to with the Cav RPG. I mean, I'm fascinated by the, by the sci-fi nature of it, by, the, by the, the background. Like I said, we've been talking about The Rock. I just really want to learn everything there is to know about The Rock. But to have the opportunity to get together with, with some people that I really like that, you know, like the fellows here in the chat, you guys, and just sit down and tell a story together and, 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 and see how Hugh handles pressure and see what Todd does when things go bad. And, you know, just, just, just have fun with that sort of thing. So I'm super looking forward to this game that's coming up at ReaperCon. Don't know who all is going to be there, but I know there's going to be a Cav RPG of some kind, even if it's just a, a, a proof of concept demo. And uh, man, I'm excited to see how that turns out. All right, guys, time to sign off. It's it's a smidgen after nine. I really appreciate you two coming on and 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 doing the show with me. You got any final words, uh, Todd? Um, no, everyone, uh, get out there, roll some dice. Now that uh, now that all the restrictions seem to be lessening up, uh, make it a point to get out to your game stores and start promoting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Especially when you get those badgers in your hand, man, take an oh. assembled badger to a game store and draw attention. It'll be awesome. Hugh, yeah, what about you? Don't worry about yep. Todd, yeah, Todd. Here I just my game game. Game. We were going to get a whole show in without talking about the badger. No, no, that's not even allowed. No. <laughs> this, the Big Stompy Podcast is about the badger. That's that's really what's going on there. It's really the Badger Snoppy podcast. That's what this is. <laughs> All right, Hugh, tell us, tell us what you get to say, man. Sign, sign us off. Uh, my plan is, as the uh, restrictions lessen up, I'm going to get out there and start doing my demos again. And the plan is to have a little diorama that people see off to the side with that badger on it. And, uh, mm -hmm calves and stuff painted up for them to go ooh what's that and bring them over to the table absolutely all right guys i really appreciate you joining us everybody out there that's stuck with us through this whole thing i, I thanks thanks very much for, for coming and hanging out with us ross wish you the best we really do love you we're just picking on you because you're not here buddy um so Saturday, uh, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, I think, we hope with Chris. Chris Lewis has been in a little under the weather lately, but we're hoping he feels good enough. He can come on and do some sculpting. And then Monday with me, and then the whole rest of the, the week, the regular schedule, Tuesday with John, Wednesday, me and John, come and hang out with us, talk about some calves. Um, as you start to get, these badgers are going to ship Friday. So when you, as, as you get them, post pictures. If you start assembling, I want to see it. Discord, Facebook, wherever you want to put them up. Build up the build up the excitement. All right, that's it. Signing off from the Badger Stompy podcast. Thanks for uh, thanks for putting up with this, guys. Out. All right, everybody. All right.